approach it open to each other, we finish our notes. On this day, all right, so here we talked about Eli Wiesel. All right, so as we continue to talk about the key elements of literary nonfiction, again, the similarity between literary nonfiction and fiction, plot, conflict, off purpose, that's slightly different. Um, point of view, okay? Point of view is also a key element that is similar among both, all right? You got first, second, and third person. We don't deal with second person too much. We spend most of our time in first and third person, but as you guys move up academically, you will see second person, especially when you get the industry of foreign and college. All right, third person, Objective on this is limited. You remember what those are, right? Mm -hmm. What is third person limited? Only one character. Right, one character, typically the protagonist. I'm missing it. all of them. It's just a flat description, okay? Any questions on point of view? Right. So you guys are pretty good with that one. Okay, so that's why I asked that question so that we can spend time here. All right. Now if you don't remember, I'll leave it up here and write down, but I think we'll be good up on it. All right, move forward. Now I asked the question, who is, or do you guys know who Frederick Douglass is? All right. The book, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Okay. Let's talk about point of view. My father was a white man. He was admitted to be such by all I ever heard speak of my parents. The opinion was also whispered that my master was my father, but of the correctness of this opinion, I know nothing. The means of knowing was withheld from me. My mother and I were separated when I was but an infant, before I knew her as my mother. It is a common custom in that part of Maryland from which I ran away to part children from their mothers at a very early age. Frequently, before the child has reached the 12th month, his mother is taken from him hired out on some farm a considerable distance off, and the child is placed under the care of an old woman, too old to feel labor. But what this separation has done, I do not know, unless it be to hinder the development of the child's affection toward his mother, and to bluntly destroy the natural affection of the mother for the child. This is the inevitable result, right? So, a couple of things we can infer. Frederick Douglass was a former slave who ran away. Um, he was the product of an interracial relationship, meaning, you know what I mean by that, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it is said, and I don't know for sure, um, it is said that his father was, in fact, his mother's owner, right? It was his master, as he said but he can't prove it. Um, he eventually went on to become a famous uh, civil rights activist, abolitionist. He was a writer. He was a prominent figure during those times. So prominent that at one point, he, a couple of times, he visited the White House. Considering a black man during the 1700s? Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, like, no, I'm not making fun of you, but like, that's, that's monumental. All right? That's monumental. So, we're going to talk about Frederick Dust a little more next week. Um, I'm actually surprised you guys made this call without really knowing who he is. But the book, The Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, is a real thing. What he's talking about actually happened. But again, the way it's being told, all right, in a creative manner. 
Okay. So obviously we know the point of view here is what? First person. Okay. Nothing a little bit complicated about that. You can tell about our pronouns I. Okay. Move forward. Now, we've talked about characterization before. All right. Again, characterization does not change because it's literary nonfiction. Characterization is that literary device that is used to draw attention to and explain the details of a character. All right, it's all in the detail. You know what, when we finish this, we're gonna play a game. What game? He'll tell us when we're finished. Be patient. I think you guys will enjoy it. All right, so two forms of characterization, explicit and implicit, all right? Explicit and implicit, in case we forgot what those are. Oh, sorry, go back. Do you remember what explicit is? Nope. We don't remember what explicit characterization is. Nope. That is direct description of the character. So we get a lot of the physical features, the height, the weight, what they look like, right? I can tell what this character is. They're 5'10", 170 pounds, fair skin, red hair, long arms, one and a half legs. Okay, you can be a war vet, right? Because he's got one stumpy leg. Huh? Implicit is a little bit more indirect, right? Think direct versus indirect characterization, right? Those are probably terms that you've heard before, before, but there are no different from explicit. Explicit is a direct description. Implicit is an indirect description. So now I'm talking more about that character's personality, the things they like and that they don't like. Over the course of an entire story, you might only get an implicit or indirect description of the character, but you get enough that by the end of the story, you have a pretty good idea of who this character is and what they're about. Does that make sense? It can also be found in the description of their behavior. The things they do, the why behind, they, the why behind what they do. All right. And again, we're going to play a little game later that will help us with characterization. All right, so to answer your question about implicit, let's take a look here. In this excerpt, right, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Do you guys know who Henrietta Lacks is? No. I'm okay. Not, I feel like I've heard it. You have. All right, you have. I forgot the exact name. I think it's called the E G. Oh, the. You know what I mean by the E G? Yeah. What What do I mean? Like the. I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if this is an actor. So, let's read this first, and I'll tell you who Henrietta Lacks is. Right. The articles all ran photos of Henrietta's family. Her oldest son sitting at his dining room table in Baltimore, looking at a genetics textbook. Her middle son in military uniform, smiling and holding a baby. But one picture stood out more than any other. In it, Henrietta's daughter, Deborah Lax, surrounded by family, everyone smiling, arms around each other, eyes bright and excited, except Deborah. She stands in the foreground, looking almost, looking alone, almost as if someone pasted her into the photo after the fact. She's 26, year old, 26 years old and beautiful, with short brown hair and cat-like eyes. But those eyes glare at the camera, hard and serious. The caption said the family had found out just a few months earlier that Henrietta Sells was still alive. Yet at that point, she'd been dead for 25 years. What? So this is what I want you to do for me. For those of you that have your phone out or your computers, it's going to work. Um, I want you to look up the E gene. And I might be wrong, I might be off on this one, but I want you to look up the Eve gene. Henrietta Lacks was a very special woman because there was something very special and specific. Huh? In human genetics, the mitochondrial age is the millennial most recent common ancestor of all living humans. 
document I gave you. There was something very specific about Henrietta's genes and her DNA in particular that made her cells special, special to the point where even today people still use what they found in her oh. blood. Uh, at the end of this definition, it says the individual from whom all living humans are bacteriologically descended. Yeah. So basically, um, she's inside her daughter. She's a what? She's inside her daughter. What? Inside her daughter. Well, obviously, she's inside her daughter. But, Wait, what? But think about what it says. It says, the caption said, the family just found out a few months ago that every other cell was still alive, even though she had been dead. For 25 years. So is she dead or she? No, she is dead. Oh, she's dead. She's still, still alive. No, Henrietta is dead. The cell is inside her body, body or so alive. But she herself. Okay, then what have they been seeing her do for the past 25 years? So they're not she's dead. Well, so they went in her grave and looked at her body? No, her DNA was still alive. How, how did they know it was alive? We have to read the book for that one. No, I don't want to read the book. So, so. All right, so now, I, even though it's not for the purposes of what we're doing right now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to use this sword. Normally, I wouldn't. Right, so, huh? yeah. So, Henrietta Lacks, all right, born Loretta Pleasant, was an African American woman whose cancer cells are the source of the HeLa cell line, the first immortalized human cell line, and one of the most important cell lines in medical research. An immortalized cell line replaces indefinitely, reproduces indefinitely under specific conditions, and the HeLa cell line continues to be a source of invaluable medical data to the present day. Lax was the unwitting source of these cells from a tumor biopsy during treatment of cervical cancer in Baltimore, Maryland. They were cultured by George Otto Gay, who created the cell line known as HeLa, which is today still used for medical research. As was then the practice, no consent was obtained to culture her cells. Consistent with modern standards, neither she nor her family were compensated for their extraction or use. So, basically, while we sit here still trying to figure out how to cure cancer, the basis of that research was in her cells. But they didn't want them to do it. Huh? But they didn't want them to do it. They no, it's not that they didn't want them to do it. It's that they, it didn't, they didn't need her consent to do it. So, she had cervical cancer. Right, so they took the several. They took some of the cells out of her cervix. Twenty-five years later, those cells were still alive because they continue to reproduce infinitely. Right, the cancer, the cancer cell, the cells that they took out of her, the cancer, the cells that they took out of her continue to reproduce. So why am I telling you all this? Because right now, as we speak, whatever medical research is being done. If you raise your hand, you don't have to say anything. Um, if you have family members that happen to, for whatever reason, have any type of cancer, they either, they either have it or they're in remission or whatever the case may be, whatever research they are doing right now to help cure that individual started with her. So are her cancer cells still alive now? Yeah. When was this made? When was it no, so she, 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 she died in 1951. So that's like 70 years. Oh my God. She died in 1951. So this was 1976. Yes. No, there's no cure for cancer. What I'm saying. Uh, I don't, we're not going to talk conspiracy theories right now. But. But what are some examples of implicit characterization in this excerpt? Uh, how she right. She stands in the foreground looking alone, almost as if someone pasted her into the photo. 
She's 26 years, 26 years old, beautiful, short brown hair, cat-like eyes, but those eyes glare at the camera, hard and serious, all right? The short brown hair, the cat-like eyes, 26 years old, beautiful. Yes? So, why are they talking about all this stuff just to tell us that her self is a lot? Like, why do we even know about her kids? No, 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 I was telling you that. It was right there. No, what I'm saying is, this excerpt is more about implicit characterization, the description of, in particular, Deborah, right? Deborah. Right, they don't really talk about Henrietta too much, although you can get an idea of Henrietta based on everything that's said in the excerpt, right? So Henrietta, without really saying anything about her specifically, you can tell she was very family oriented, right? Because everybody's sitting around, they're together, everybody's fairly successful. I mean, you got a kid, you got a kid that's, her oldest son is sitting at the dining room table, looking at a genetics textbook, the middle school kid joined the military, he just had a baby, I mean, middle, middle son, middle son. I said middle school. I saw a middle and an S, and I just went to middle school. All right. But again, this is more about implicit um, characterization. But I just wanted you guys to have some background on who Henry had relaxed. Does that make sense? So if you ever find yourself bored one day, like really look her up and read about her. Like she was special. She was special like that. All right. So one thing I want you to really, I want you to pay attention to, ladies really, and gentlemen, you might want to take notes on this one, all right? Because we will be coming back around to characterization, okay? It, explicit or direct characterization, okay? Then we have implicit or indirect. Now, obviously, we've talked about what direct is, all right? Those are statements made directly to describe the character, direct statements that describe the character, okay? Implicit, not so much. You get a little bit of information about the character, but it's mostly through their actions and their behavior, okay? And there is an acronym that I would like you guys to become familiar with that pertains to indirect or implicit characterization, beast. Behavior, effects on others, appearance, speech, thoughts, and feelings, okay? Behavior, effect on others, appearance, speech, thoughts, and feelings. Remember, these things are not directly stated. You gotta pay attention to them as you read whatever text you wanna read. is another common uh, key element between fiction and nonfiction, okay? All right? That's the attitude that the writer has towards the subject. We know that, all right? Tone can be conveyed by choice of words or the viewpoint, directly or indirectly stated the viewpoint of the author, okay? Now, tone can take many forms. It can be formal, it can be informal, serious, comic, sarcastic, sad or cheerful or any other existing attitude, 
okay? You don't have to write all that down. Again, we should be familiar with what tone is by this point, but if you are not, or you don't remember by all means, go ahead and take note. All right, moving forward. Let's take a look at this one right here, okay? Let's see if we can determine the tone of the author. I remind myself that I am now a full grown man. No one will ever again card me for a drink or demand that I weave a floor mat out of newspapers. At my age, a reasonable person should have completed his sentence in the prison of the nervous and insecure. Isn't that the great promise of adulthood? I can't help but think that somewhere along the way, I made a wrong turn. My fears have not vanished. Rather, they have seasoned and multiplied with age. I am now twice as frightened as I was when, at the age of 20, I allowed a failed nursing student to inject me with a horse tranquilizer and eight times more anxious than I was the day my kindergarten teacher pried my fingers off my mother's ankle and led me screaming toward my desk. You'll get used to it, the woman has said. I'm still waiting. So what do we think the tone is? Hmm? Depressing? Leia? Kind of a mix between a mix between fear and expecting. Fear and expectation? Why expectation? Because he says he's still waiting to like get used to the fact that all this time he's still been afraid of certain things. Okay. Anybody else? Christian? Hmm? Would you care to comment on the tone of the excerpt? Hmm. Good. Why anxious? Oh, no, 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 I'm no, no, Kirsten. no, 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 Okay. Either. Right. I would. I would agree with, with with all of that. Right. I would agree with all that. It's, I feel like his tone is one of. I would say there's disappointment. Yeah, like disappointment, and he didn't grow up. He didn't grow up the way he was expecting. Because he's always been told, when you're a kid, don't worry about it. When you're an adult, it gets better. You'll get past this. That last sentence, you'll get used to it. You'll get used to the fear and the anxiety of being a child and being afraid of everything. But now here he is, basically 40-something years old, still with those issues, right? So I think he's more, I think he's as much disappointed as anything. He's like, I really expected to be past this point. Like, what's going on? Right. So... Figurative language, we hit on that a lot during, po uh, during poetry, all right? It's a more effective, persuasive, and impactful way of writing, okay? Literary devices that you use, they go beyond literal, okay? Which is what you guys are doing now as you work through your critical analysis, okay? In order to give the readers new insights or appeal to the senses of the reader, I want you to see it, I want you to feel it, I want you to hear it. I work hard not to be born. But for some reason, I cannot get you guys off your phone. Like, I'm like, 
All right, we're actually almost at the end, believe it or not. All right. So, George Orwell. Here, so here are some examples of big language, okay? In our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Things like the continuance of British rule in India, the Russian purges and deportations, the dropping of atom bombs in Japan can indeed be defended, but only by arguments which are too brutal for most people to face and which do not square with the professed aims of political parties. Thus, political language has to consist largely of euphemisms, question begging, and sheer cloudy vagueness. Defenseless villages are bombarded from the air, inhabitants driven out into the countryside. The cattle machine gun, a hut set on fire with incendiary bullets. This is called pacification. Millions of peasants are robbed of their farms and sent trudging along the roads with no more than they can carry. This is called transfer of population or rectification of frontiers. People are imprisoned for years without trial or shot in the back of the neck, sent to die of scurvy in Arctic lumber camps. This is called elimination of unreliable elements. Deep. A lot of imagery there. A lot of imagery, a lot of symbolism. All right. The end. Are you going to let me get to it? Oh, we can learn something. We're going to get nowhere.